Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, my name is Skip Rutherford, Dean of the Clinton School, and welcome today. I, I uh, appreciate everybody being here. You're going to uh, be in for a, a very good program based on our conversations uh, this morning about the uh, 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 young people voting and, 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 and what's happening with American democracy. Uh, to introduce the speaker is a good friend of mine. Uh, who actually was uh, mainly responsible for getting him here. Uh, I met Dave Anderson uh, when he was uh, a young rising star working in the 1992 Clinton campaign. He did media relations, uh, and he was, uh, he was very innovative at the time with new ideas and, and new approaches. Uh, he went on uh, to work uh, with uh, MTV at Rock the Vote. Um, where he and Mark crossed paths. Um, and then uh, he took on photography as a new career uh, and uh, has done a spectacular job. His work's been displayed all over the world. We use him, have uh, used him uh, in our Frank magazine. And his, his book, Rough Beauty, about a small town in Texas, which was uh, known for its uh, KKK past, uh, has prompted uh, uh, tremendous interest, including a major spread in the New York Times. Um, and uh, he, he lives in Little Rock. His, his studio is in Little Rock. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Ashley, are the parents of a wonderful little boy named Noah. And uh, we're glad to work with him here at the Clinton School. So uh, please give a, a welcome to Dave Anderson. Thanks, Skip. And, uh, and as always, I, uh, I, th I think many people here understand what a resource this, uh, this lecture series is. All the work that Skip and Patrick and Nikolai and all the people at, here at the Clinton School do to bring speakers like this here. And um, uh, it's, it's truly a resource and one of the things that makes me happiest to live here in Little Rock. And um, normally, the, uh, the, the names here are big you know, names of uh, a lot of famous people coming through here. Um, so why have a, a state representative from Texas? There's, how many state representatives are there in Texas? 150, and then in all the other states, there's similar amounts. So he's, in some ways, a political needle in the haystack. Um, on, <laughs> in some ways, but in, in important ways, not at all. Um, uh, I met Mark on the uh, Choose or Lose bus when he was uh, working with Rock the Vote and MTV, and, and I was too. And, uh, and he too has had an incredible rise um, in, in the world of uh, progressive politics and, um, and also just in the world of ideas and making the world a better place. People always get categorized as politicians. He is an elected official now, so in a sense he's a politician. But, um, Mark, the reason Mark uh, is here is because he has a mind like very few others. And he has uh, a way of looking at the world and at politics and bringing people into the process and improving the world around us um, in a way that is exciting and different. And, um, and he's really, you know, he's just not like other politicians. And that's why um, I, I, I hope everyone will uh, uh, enjoy his, his talk and, uh, and uh, question him in real detail because he has things to say you won't hear other politicians talking about and he has ideas um, that other people just don't even, that just don't even occur to other people. Um, the, the simplest and easiest example I always like to brag on him on is that he invented online voter registration. Uh, 12 years ago when it wasn't cool to do anything online. Um, and uh, he has had a, uh, he's, he's been in the legislature not for very many years, but is already um, uh, becoming uh, known in the state of Texas as, as a real uh, force. And uh, I, of course, like to believe that we'll, we'll see him uh, in, in much higher office before too long. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it. But in the meantime, he's doing great stuff at a local level. Thank you. 
Well, that, that turned out to be a really nice introduction. It got off to a little bit of an auspicious start for me. And at the point where you were talking about how, I mean, before you got to the part about a rare mind, once in a generation stuff, it was, you know, when he was talking about the sort of any old state representative, I resolved to tell this story, which I wasn't going to tell. The best introduction I ever got in politics was when I was introduced to a six-year-old girl named Hannah Malinowski. Hannah uh, had become interested in me as a politician when my yard sign started popping up in some of her neighbor's yards. Hannah was learning to read. And she was on a walk in her neighborhood with her parents. And she pointed at my yard sign. And she sounded out my name. And her parents gave her all of this praise to encourage her in her reading skills because they were pretty astounded that she'd figured out that combination of symbols and gotten it right. So they, they praised her for, for saying my name. So she found that every time she said my name, her parents would praise her. And so she got this wonderful feeling in her heart about me. So she'd walk around the house, Mark Strama this, Mark Strama that, you know? <laughs> and then one day, she was at home watching television, and one of my television commercials came on TV. And she sees me on the same television set with Bugs Bunny and Cookie Monster and all of her favorite people. So now I'm bigger than life to her. I mean, she's really taking an interest in this. So one day, about two weeks before the last election, I was passing out flyers at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Pflugerville at their annual fall festival. And this woman whom I'd never met came up to me and said, oh, you're Mark Strama. My daughter loves you. Can I take you to meet her? And I told her I was married. And she said, no, no, no. My daughter is six years old. <laughs> and I said, now, why would a six-year-old girl have any interest in meeting me? And she explained what had happened with the thing. And so, so she takes me back to the activity center of the church where Hannah and her little friends were finger painting. And she taps Hannah on the shoulder. And she says, Hannah, look who I've got. And Hannah turns around and looks up and sees me, and her eyes get this big. And she said, oh my gosh, it's Mark Strama. <laughs> and this little six-year-old finger painting next to Hannah turns to her and says, who's Mark Strama? <laughs> and little Hannah turns to her friend very earnestly and says, I have no idea. <laughs> but he's famous. <laughs> it, is a, it is a great honor to be here, Skip. Thank you for having me. Dave, thank you for thinking that I was worth bringing here. I saw the list of speakers. In fact, Jim Wallace, I think, is going to be here tomorrow. He's in Austin today. And I would actually be there listening to him if I weren't here talking to you. I'm really honored to be um, among the folks who y'all would bring in for this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about having worked at Rock the Vote and spent a good part of my life uh, trying to get people more involved in politics. Uh, and in my election, when I was elected, I won by 500 out of 65,000 votes. And it, it, the difference between winning or losing for me was an increase in voter turnout by about 5,000 <coughs> votes abo above what people expected. In fact, uh, when, I, when I won by such a narrow margin, my opponent actually challenged the outcome of the election and filed a legal petition to have a court overturn the outcome. And part of the basis for his challenge in his legal brief was that 3,000 people in my district had registered to vote between the 2002 election when he had been elected and the 2004 election when I beat him. And 4,000 people who had been registered before but had never voted, voted for the first time in that 2004 election. And so his legal petition actually said, this is a quote, that these numbers were so statistically implausible as to constitute a violation of the Texas election code and were part of a, this is a direct quote, part of a pattern of behavior to alter the outcome of the election. <laughs> To which I said, guilty. <laughs> That's what a campaign is, is a pattern of behavior to alter the outcome of the election. And in my view, the way that my party can start winning in places where they haven't been winning, and the way we started doing that in, 
in my election in 04, more pronouncedly in 06. I think even more pronouncedly this election year, the way we do that is to get people who haven't been traditional voters to get, to get them to vote. Uh, and that is what made the difference in my race. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the systemic failures in our democracy that keep people from voting. Because when Dave was traveling around the country with MTV and I was working at Rock the Vote, we actually witnessed a historic low in voter participation among young people in 1996. Our job was to turn the youth vote out, so I always refer to it as the most colossal failure I've ever been a part of. Uh, it was a great job. I learned a ton from it. I met great people, lifelong friendships. Uh, but we weren't able to deliver young people to the polls, despite extraordinary success registering them to vote, by the way. I mean, we did. Online, we registered 50,000. Over an 800 number, we registered a quarter of a million. We could add up and point to a real, real voter registrations totaling a million registrants. But we did not get them to vote. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what it is that, that keeps people from participating. Uh, we did focus groups on it. We did polls about it. We, you know, I've read most of the academic literature on the subject. Uh, but there are some structural issues in play. Uh, there was a United States senator in the late 1800s named Mark Hanna, who was the Karl Rove of his generation. Besides being a senator, he was the architect of the McKinley administration at a time of the rapid industrialization of the country. It was, it was Mark Hanna who, who went to the big business community and said, if you want government to treat you the way you want to be treated, you got to treat politicians the way they wanted to be treated. When Mark Hanna retired from the United States Senate, he said, in all the time I've spent in politics, I've learned only two things matter in politics. The first one is money, and I can't remember the other one. <laughs> now, money does have a pernicious influence on the political system. It does. Uh, in Texas, that, is, that influence is particularly pronounced. We have no limits. I don't know what your laws are here for state races and local races in Arkansas, but in Texas, there are no limits on the amount of money an individual can give a candidate for public office. The effect of that has led to extraordinarily large donations by an extraordinarily small group of people who have an extraordinarily undue amount of influence on the policymaking process as a result. In Texas, fewer than 400 donors accounted for 50% of all the contributions to politicians for state office in the 2002 election cycle. Fewer than 400 accounted for 50% of all the funds raised and spent by politicians. Fewer than 100 of them accounted for 22% of all the funds raised and spent. And in Probably the most you know, amazing thing I've ever seen, there were about five candidates in the last election cycle who raised a million dollars to run for state representative. 98% of their funds came from one individual. I mean, it's hard to imagine that the general public is as represented by that, by a politician from whom who raised 98% of their money from one individual. It's hard to imagine that the general public feels they're getting a fair shake from that politician. It's hard to imagine. So, so I, I've always believed that there is a problem with the way we finance our campaigns. You know, they ask the bank robber why he robs banks, and he says that's where they keep the money. If you are facing a competitive campaign and you have to raise a state rep race now, it costs about a million dollars in a competitive district in Texas. If you have to raise a million dollars, you can't just say, oh, I'll raise it on the internet. You know, I'm a big believer in the power of the internet to level the playing field. Uh, and we did use the internet extensively in my campaigns. But if you're a down ballot candidate and you're not a rock star on national television every day, people don't come to your website looking to throw money at you. You have to build a huge base of support to be able to leverage the, the power of the internet for your fundraising purposes, and you still have to do the traditional go to the major donors, get them to believe in your candidacy, and get them to support you. The, the influence of those major donors, many of whom give money for purely philanthropic reasons because they truly believe in the candidates and the causes, but many others of whom have much more cynical reasons for giving money. And 
I, I've had politicians who disagreed with me and denied that. I've asked them to explain the phenomenon of the major donors who give money to both candidates running against each other. What could be the possible philanthropic purpose in that? That is clearly, an, a, that, is, that is the crassest, most cynical demonstration of the purpose behind much political donation, which is influence peddling. Legalized corruption. Somebody, as many people have said, it's not what's illegal in the political system, it's what's legal. The taking and the raising and taking of money from people who have vested interests in what policies we enact and how we vote in office. And it's one of the reasons why incumbents are so hard to defeat, because incumbents have that vote that brings with it a lot of that influence purchasing political contribution. Uh, and I ran against an incumbent. I ran an, I raised an unprecedented amount of money for a challenger in a state house race in Texas. I raised about half a million dollars. I was still outspent by a quarter of a million dollars. And I can tell you, if you don't think that money has an influence, let me tell you how the polls tracked our race. I, I raised my money early, and I spent my money early. In Texas, we have something called early voting. I think you have it in Arkansas, too. And it enables people to vote uh, for 10 days, starting 10 days before the election uh, at any location around town. And, and in Texas, it's a popular way for people to not have to worry about trying to rush to the polls between 7 AM and 7 PM on election day. It's, you're less likely to have to wait in line. You can go to any polling place around town so you don't have to be in your neighborhood on the day that you vote. Uh, it's, it's a lot of people use it. We spent our money early. We, defi we had to do that to define the race and to introduce me to the voters. Uh, my opponent probably didn't take the race seriously enough early on. And so about two weeks before the election, they did a poll and found that I was up by five points, which nobody expected because it was a pretty Republican district. Uh, so I was up by five points. And all of a sudden, three checks for $100,000 from major donors got written to my opponent. And in the last two weeks of the campaign, I just got hammered, outspent by a quarter of a million dollars, all of it negative advertising and pretty effective negative advertising. Uh, you know, the, you know, my opponent actually got married shortly before the election. And so he sent out this glossy brochure that really looked like the photo album from his wedding. And it had him and his tux and his bride and her gown surrounded by their family. Jack Stick supports the institution of marriage. And then you opened it up, and it had a picture of me from the mid-'90s when I had long hair and worked at Rock the Vote. And it was photoshopped <laughs> in front of a wedding cake with two little plastic men on top of it. And it said, Mark Strama supports same-sex marriage and is endorsed by the Austin Lesbian Gay Political Caucus. And I opened that one out of my mailbox, which meant that they'd mailed it to everybody in the district with no targeting. It had even gone to Democratic voters. And I said, hmm, that's pretty effective. <laughs> that's that's going to cost me some votes. And, uh, and it did. I won the early vote by 3%. I lost the election day vote by 3%. I woke up the morning of election day, having been on the receiving end of about six direct mail pieces like that and some television ads that had me photoshopped behind bars and turned into a cartoon character and all of that. I woke up on election day, kissed my then fiance, now wife, and said, we're going to lose this one. Don't take it too hard. And then I went and worked for the, at the polls for 12 hours. And I was right. I lost election day by 3%. That quarter of a million dollars spent against me in the last two weeks had taken me from a five-point advantage to a three-point deficit. But I am here today. I was elected because more people voted during the early voting period than voted on election day by a 60-40 margin. I won the early vote by three points. I lost election day by three points. I won by the margin of people who voted early instead of on election day. And for all I know, many of the people who voted for me during early voting would have liked to have had that vote back after they got some of that negative mail about me. Uh, <laughs> but you don't get it back. Uh, my, and I learned, I mean, that was important. I, my message on election night was that I'm going to work as hard to represent the people who voted against me as I did the people who vote, as I will work for the people who voted for me. That I understand that this is a closely divided district 
and that I have an obligation to be to have an open door to everybody. And I tried to do that, and I got reelected last cycle by 13,000 votes, won every precinct in the district, and it was a big and frankly, and they ran a pretty good candidate against me last time. Uh, so that that my point is to illustrate the influence that money has in political campaigns, but. What Mark Hanna forgot, the, thing, the second thing that's most powerful in politics, is what Tom DeLay taught us in Texas in 2003, which is redistricting. Because redistricting preordains the outcomes of 90% of the elections in this country. Most districts are genu genuinely uncompetitive in November. Most of my colleagues, I, have, I frankly consider it a, a luxury that I get to represent a district that is fairly evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. Because it means that I am always accountable to the people who vote in November, which is a population that is about three times the size of the people who vote in primary. My election is decided by the general election voter, the mainstream voter, the center of the political spectrum, determines whether I get reelected or not. Most Politicians do not have that luxury. Most politicians represent districts that are either 60% or more Republican or 60% or more Democrat. And if you're a Democrat representing a 65% Democratic district, you're not going to get defeated by a Republican. So if you assume that they look only at their political self-interest, which most of them don't, Democrats and Republicans mostly are not looking just at their political self-interest, but if you assume that, they're not interested in any of the Republican voters in their districts if they're in a 65% Democratic district. Those voters have no say in whether they get reelected. They are not accountable to those voters in any material way. They're only going to get beaten, if they get beaten, from their left if they're, in a, if they're a Democrat representing a 65% Democratic district. So they have very little incentive to deviate from party orthodoxy. They have very little incentive to compromise and meet in the middle. They have strong disincentives to do so because that could get them hurt in a primary. And the exact same is true for Republicans in 65% Republican districts. It is part, it is a big part, I think, of what has polarized our policymaking processes and our legislative processes because people are scared to venture to the center because there's no upside in it. And there's a lot of downside. That's a problem, I think. So the way we learned that lesson in Texas, y'all probably remember, was the big conflagration when the Democrats, and this was the year before I was elected, when the Democrats fled the state to break the quorum to prevent Tom DeLay from re-redistricting in 2003. Now, I assume everybody knows the way redistricting is used to predetermine the outcomes of elections. The way it is used, it, redistricting exists because we have to try to keep an equal number of voters in each district. So we do redistricting in years that end with one, because what happens in years that end with zero? We do a census. So every 10 years, we count the people, and we see that the population has shifted. And we reapportion them in the districts because of a Supreme Court ruling called Baker versus Carr that articulated a principle that should have been one person, one vote. But at the time, they said one man, one vote. And that principle meant that you get an equal number of voters in each district. And that is why we redistrict. Now, once we start redistricting, the games begin. And both parties have been guilty of it for time out of mind. And in Texas, it had been the Democrats for 80 years who had had the power in redistricting and had used it to instantiate their own power and prevent Republicans from electing their fair share of, of representatives. Uh, and in 2001, following the 2000 census, the Republicans finally, finally were able to draw a map that gave them a majority in the Texas House of Representatives for the first time since Reconstruction. They got an 88-62 majority. They controlled the House. They controlled the Senate. They controlled every statewide office. And they said, now we get to do what we've been wanting to do for a long time. And Tom DeLay came down to Austin in 2003 as majority leader of the Republican House and said, we're going to redraw these congressional districts. There was no new census data on which to base a reapportionment. There was no reason to believe that 
a redistricting effort would get us any closer to one person, one vote, to an equal apportionment of voters among districts. It was strictly, declaredly, avowedly, exclusively for the purpose of changing the outcomes of who was elected. There was a basis for his argument. In politics, almost, there's almost always a basis for every argument. The basis was Texas is a Republican state, and yet we have a majority of Democrats in our congressional delegation. That can't be. These boundaries must be unfair. There are, it's an arguable point. Many of the Democrats in Congress from Texas represented majority Republican districts, but they were long-serving members with a real relationship with the voters and with real seniority in Congress. There's been some observations that if we still had those five members in Congress today, Texas would have chairmanships of some of the most important committees in Congress now that Democrats are back in the majority. We lost that when the re-redistricting effort changed our, con our congressional delegation. But there was a basis for the argument. It did seem weird that 17 Democrats and 14 Republicans were being elected from Texas's congressional districts, and that was the basis of Tom DeLay's argument for redistricting. It had never been done before. Never before had we done redistricting just for the purpose of changing the partisan composition of the, of the people who've been elected. It was, it was a stretch. It Personally, it offended me and my sensibilities. It was what got me back into politics. I had left politics. I was in the private sector. I was happy. Uh, but I was really appalled by this. And it is what drew me to run in 2004. My opponent, the guy I ran against, had taken $80,000 from Tom DeLay's political action committees and then voted for that redistricting plan, though it divided the district I now represent among three different congressional districts, one stretching to Houston, one stretching to the Rio Grande Valley, and one stretching to San Antonio, when previously that entire area had been in one congressional district and it elected a congressperson who represented Austin, just Austin. So it was a clear, I mean, it was clearly the wrong thing to do from a pure sort of constituent service district representation issue. Uh, and the fact that there were $80,000 of questionable contributions contributing to that decision certainly helped my political campaign. Uh, so redistricting and money have circumscribed the power of voters in a way that is, I think, very anti-democratic. That said, I'm actually optimistic. I have, despite those pretty profound limitations in our democracy, two things make me think that, that things are getting better. And the biggest one is the way the internet has revolutionized and unleashed the power of everyday voters. And I, I watched this uh, when, the, when the Senate Democrats fled to New Mexico to try to block redistricting, to break the quorum, to prevent the legislature from taking action on Tom DeLay's redistricting plan. I asked moveon.org to send an email out to their members to ask to raise some money to help these senators because it was an expensive undertaking. Moveon.org sent an email out. We thought we'd raise $25,000. We wrote a letter from one of the senators uh, tell, explaining the situation. I remember when we clicked send on the email, I went and got dinner. I came back, and we had raised $250,000 while I was at dinner at an average donation of $33. I couldn't believe it. This, is a, this was when I would started contemplating getting back into politics, because I thought maybe I could run for office and harness some of that power and get elected without having to do it the traditional way. It is harder to do that kind of thing at a down ballot local level. It is easier when you have a database to start out with of a couple of million email addresses of people who've opted in and given you permission to send them emails about things that they think they have a common interest in. Uh, but that is an extraordinary power, and you're seeing that power even more defined in this presidential election. I, it is not just a fundraising power, although the fundraising power behind it is important. It is the power that caused 75 people, four and a half months before the election, to show up at 9 o'clock this past Saturday morning in Austin, Texas to go do a voter registration drive in East Austin.
getting 75 bodies on a Saturday morning that far from the election is just unheard of, unheard of. But it's the kind of thing that's happening all over the country this election cycle. And it gives me, I think, reason for that to feel a lot of optimism. Uh, I want to stop talking and go to questions, but I want to tell two last quick stories. One is the other thing that makes me optimistic about our democracy, despite the limitations. I hate talking about all these things that don't work right, but I don't think you can be effective working within the system unless you're aware of those obstacles. And so I, I talk about them a lot to young people who I'm trying to encourage to engage despite those obstacles. Uh, but, but I also want you to think about what happened here in 2000. In 2000, you had the incumbent vice president, second most powerful man in the country in the free world, running against the governor of Texas whose brother was the governor of Florida. And you had it come down, 100 million people voted in a 15 hour span. 100 million people voted on an infrastructure erected overnight, torn down the next night, almost entirely run by volunteers. 100 million people voted, and the margin of victory came down to 1,000 votes in Florida, where 6 million people had voted. 1,000 votes in Florida. At the time, I was working in the private sector, and one of the engineers in my company who had taken an interest in politics just that year, because most engineers aren't. And uh, he, he had been up all night on election night, the same as I had. I remember actually watching the returns, Dave, at your house that night in New York. And, uh, and I stayed up all night watching him, and he had stayed up all night. He comes in the next morning all disheveled, and he said, Mark, they're never going to know who won that election. Because trying to calibrate an election to that degree, 1,000 votes out of 100 million, with our election technology at that time, is like trying to weigh a subatomic particle on a bathroom scale can't be done. And it's true. That election had a much significantly larger margin of error than the margin of victory, which meant that it had to be decided. There was no way it wasn't going to be decided through administrative bureaucracies and courts. So it goes all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. It takes us 28 days to find out who the president is, and we get a 5-4 decision that says that the Florida election where the brother of the governor was one of the candidates, had been decided in favor of the governor's brother by a 5-4 decision of justices, mainly who had been appointed by the candidate's father. And the second most powerful man in the free world had to vacate the White House as a result of that decision. And during all of this time, there were no tanks in the streets. There were no secret conspirators gathering in quarters to discuss their options. The American faith in the democratic process almost exceeds the reality. But it makes the reality so much better. I mean, it was phenomenal that Al Gore stepped aside and that his supporters stepped aside. There are not many countries where that would have happened. Contrast that with what happens today if you lose an election in Iraq, for example. You have no faith. One of the reasons Al Gore and his supporters were willing to step aside was that they knew in four years they'd get another crack at it. They knew that they would. If you're on the losing side of an election in Iraq, you go get your gun. Because you have no reason to believe, in fact, your entire history leads you to believe that whoever's in power is going to consolidate power and repress dissent. And that you're never going to get another chance to have an election. And that's why it's so much harder. It's an amazing thing that we did in this country. So. Uh, that inspires me. The last thing I, I want to tell you is a story from Ann Richards. I worked for Ann in 1990 in her first campaign for governor. I was 22 years old. I was just out of college. And I'll be honest with you, I was terrified of Ann Richards. She scared me to death. Most charming public figure I've ever seen. Also the most intimidating private figure I've ever been around. And uh, uh, I, I, 15 years later, I decided to run for this office. And I, I, you know, everybody told me, you've got to call Ann Richards. And you've got to ask for her support. And I found that at the age of 37, I was as scared of Ann Richards as I had been when I was 22. I called her up. I told her I was running. And I asked her if she would support me. And she was very stern with me. She said, Mark, why are you doing this? And I was nervous. So I launched into my entire stump speech. I started telling her everything I believe in and all of the issues that I care about, and all of the ways that I could make a difference if I was elected. And I poured all of my passion and idealism into this way too lengthy soliloquy. And when I ran out of breath, there was five seconds of silence on the other end of the phone. And for the first time in all the time that I'd known her, Ann Richards softened up toward me. And she said, oh, sweetie, 
<laughs> that may be the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. She said, the only smart reason to run for office is because you can win. So why don't you tell me how you're going to win? Which is a great lesson because while we all get into public service or politics with visions and ideals and principles and passion, we don't get much done unless we can manage to combine that with pragmatism. And so she got me focused on the practical realities of what it was going to take for me to win that unlikely race. And it was a very, very valuable lesson. With that, I'd love to entertain questions for as much time as y'all Y'all have. Yes, ma'am. Photo ID at the polls. Photo ID. Proof of citizenship when you Proof register. Can you put those variables under the concept in the future? Where do you see that these variables are going to change the culture of participatory democracy? That's a great question because we are moving in opposite directions at the same time, aren't we? That, that we had a bill last session. This is one of my favorite moments in the last legislative session. My desk mate, rising star named Rafael Anchia, Texas Monthly predicts he'll be the first Hispanic governor of Texas, uh, sits on the elections committee. And there was a bill to require proof of citizenship upon voter registration. Now, proof of citizenship means you've got to have your original birth certificate. Uh, I can't, re there wasn't much else that would get you proof of citizenship other than your original birth. There was one other document that qualified. Pro passport, I don't think qualified it. Uh, and so the chair of the Republican Party of Texas was there testifying for the bill. Raphael, who is a, an attorney, leaned over to cross-examine her and he said, Chairman Binkheiser, I assume you consider the privilege of testifying before a committee of the Texas House an important right of citizenship. Is that the case? I do. Absolutely. As important as voting, similar to the privilege of voting. Absolutely. That's my whole point, Representative Anchia. That's why we've got to protect the integrity of these registration procedures by requiring this proof of citizenship. Uh, you know, in, and she says, well, OK. Before I listen to any more of this, can I see your proof of citizenship? Of course she didn't have it with her. Nobody carries that around with them. Said, Why should I listen to the rest of this? Because proving citizenship upon voter registration would take 95% of the people we registered through Rock the Vote off the books. You wouldn't be able to do it. You, people don't have that. The photo ID thing, I know everybody by now has heard the story about the nuns in Indiana who got turned away. Does everybody know that story? We will see how this plays out. Uh, it's been a big fight in the Texas legislature. I see it as similar to those other pernicious influences that erect barriers that keep people from voting. Uh, that said, Motor Voter didn't increase voter turnout among young people in 1996. At Young people and, and all disaffected populations need more than just the removal of, of structural barriers to voting. They need inspiration. They need connection. They need to believe in the politicians who are seeking their votes. They need to feel like the politicians are talking to them, which almost never happens because of this self-fulfilling dynamic where politicians are encouraged by their consultants only talk to the voters. You've got finite resources. You can't talk to everybody. You're going to have to focus your energy on the likeliest voters. And the likeliest voters, mean, focusing your energy on them means ignoring that huge population of folks who historically don't vote. And so you ask them why they don't vote. They say, well, nobody's talking to me. I remember going to New Hampshire during the New Hampshire primaries in 1996. And I, I pulled into town the day after WMUR, the local New Hampshire, the only local affiliate news station in, in New Hampshire, had done a story the night before where they'd gone to the University of New Hampshire and asked all the kids on campus who's running for president. This was three weeks before the election. And if you live in New Hampshire, you not only know who all the candidates are for president, you've met them all, right? You've met them all. 
in New Hampshire. It's a phenomenal experience. It's the coolest thing in the world. If you're a political junkie and you ever get a chance to go spend an election cycle in New Hampshire or Iowa, it's like being a six-year-old in Disney World. It's the best thing ever. And these kids didn't know. These University of New Hampshire kids didn't know. So I pull into town ready to get the youth vote out. And the first gas station I stopped at, the guy starts telling me, no, 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 we don't want those young people to vote. They don't even know who's running. They're not into it. They're not paying attention. They don't care. They don't deserve to vote. And I asked this guy, how many presidential candidates have knocked on your door at your house? Like four of them have. How many times a day does your phone ring from one of the campaigns? He said, it never stops ringing. How many pieces of mail do you get from people running for president every day? He said, my mailbox is full of it. And how many times on the shows you watch on television and the radio stations you listen to do you hear political advertisements all the time? None of those things are true for those kids at University of New Hampshire. The, none of their addresses are on anybody's mailing list in the presidential campaigns. None of the radio stations they listen to are targeted with, with radio advertising. There's, there was no outreach to those kids in 1996. This year, that has changed. I told all the down-ballot candidates in Texas in, the, in this past primary cycle, make sure you're advertising on The Daily Show. Because there's going to be hundreds of thousands of voters in Texas who've never voted before, who are going to vote in the presidential race, because for the first time, they've been talked to by these presidential candidates. And they're not going to know who you are. And there's going to be some squirrely down ballot results, very unpredictable, because there's a bunch of people who got there to vote for president and then look and see, oh my gosh, I got to vote for all these people? So you better make sure you drive your name ID up with The Daily Show's audience. And that proved out, actually. The Daily, you know, that you could see a statistical correlation between those folks. Name ID was a big, big driver in down ballot races. To, to your point, I think that. Structurally, things may not be getting better and might be getting worse. I think that organically, things are getting much better. And I think organics triumph over politics. Yes, sir. When am I? Thank you. Right. Well, some of the lo it's a very good question. Uh, there are certain types of political contributions you cannot make. You can't make a contribution from a corporation, which was one of the issues that came up in that investigation of the $80,000 that my opponent had gotten. Uh, you cannot make contributions that don't get reported. And you cannot, you cannot, as a politician, accept contributions and spend them on your personal, uh, you know, you can't pay your house mortgage with them. You can't. You can't use them to your personal benefit. You have to use them for a, a designated campaign purpose. Yes, sir. Right. Came from one guy. I think it does. I, well, without me commenting on the integrity of the folks who accepted those donations, I will say I know some who turned down money because they felt that it would be, it would become too much a part of their overall fundraising portfolio. I know a woman who lost by 40 votes in a Republican primary against somebody who raised a million dollars from one donor and no other donations of any significance. And this woman whose plight was seen around the state because everybody knew that she was having a million dollars spent against her in the primary, all of it coming from one guy who had it in for her. And this woman declined a $300,000 contribution from one person who wanted to counterbalance all that money from that million dollar donor. She declined it because she thought it was inappropriate and she lost by 40 votes. And go back to my Ann Richards story. Did she do the right thing? a hard question. That is a hard question. Yes, sir. Mark, did you uh, discuss the Obama-Clinton campaign and what you see 
I will. I will. And, and I'll tie it into this. One of the things that I think is so powerful about Obama, I talked about how when I went to that event, there were all these people, and they looked like the future of Texas. They had 25,000 people, and it just looked like the future of Texas. And politicians dance with them that brung them. You dance with who brought you to the dance. And this guy, if he gets to the White House, was brought there by so many people, average donations below $100, raising hundreds of millions of dollars that way. By being accountable to everyone, he's accountable to no one. I mean, by being accountable to such a broad base of people, he'll govern from a platform that includes constituencies who've never had a seat at the table before. I think that is, that is very promising. I think some of the people who are excited about Obama are as much excited about his support base as about him. He, he, early on, I think he was a, a, an empty vessel for people's hopes. Uh, he has become a more defined candidate with all the flaws that human beings have when we take them from hope to reality. Uh, he, has, you know, he has become human. And so now you, he will campaign as a politician, not as an empty vessel for people's hopes. But, but people have imbued into his candidacy a lot of their beliefs about process and about democracy and about what, what this country ought to look like and, and how it ought to make its decisions collectively. And that's still, that's still part of his brand, even as he's come down to earth and become humanized. Um, I think that this protracted primary process I can say, speaking from the perspective of Texas, it's been the best thing that ever happened to the Democratic Party in Texas. We raised extraordinary money for the party by virtue of having those two candidates in town. We've always been ignored, always been ignored in Texas by the National Party. We send gobs of money from our major donors up to the DSCC and the DCCC and to the presidential campaigns. None of it ever gets spent in Texas because we're never in play. Our first time of being in play was, first of all, unbelievable fun. And secondly, great organizationally. Not only did we raise some money, we collected, the state party collected 700,000 email addresses the night of our primaries. Because remember, we had a primary and a caucus. So uh, I mean, I, I'm in a, I live in a Republican precinct, heavily Republican precinct. I represent a Republican district, but it's close. My precinct ain't close. I lose my precinct by 20 points the first time I ran. But 400 people, almost 400 people, showed up at our caucus the night of the presidential primary in Texas. All of those folks gave their email addresses. All of those folks can now be communicated with by the party, frictionlessly, free, interactive. That's a lot, that is a powerful platform on which to start to build a party. Texas Democratic Party has not been well organized in the past. That is changing dramatically. I, th I think, as I, I look, I think McCain was the right guy for the Republicans to nominate, and I think he's a formidable candidate, and I think that he has tremendous appeal to independent and swing voters in my district. He'll do very well, because uh, that's the prevailing ethic of my district, those independent and swing voters. Uh, I think he's a formidable candidate. But the fact that he hasn't led in a single poll head-to-head -head by any statistically significant margin while the, while the Democrats had been clobbering each other, clobbering each other. The fact that McCain couldn't use this honeymoon after locking up the nomination under great circumstances, ran without any money, you know, overcame all the odds, and, he, and he's clearly enjoying the honeymoon right now, and he still can't get he still can't get ahead in the polls at a time when the Democratic Party is totally fractured. I think the party building value, the toughening of the candidates, the refinement of their messages, all of that is going to contribute to them being better, to the Democratic Party being stronger rather than weaker as a result of this. Obviously, that can get out of things could get out of hand, but they haven't yet. Uh, yes, sir. You have a more broadly I have. Uh, I would. I don't know East Texas well enough to say that he is not just a product of the Texas political system, but of the East Texas political system. I'm, Charlie Wilson's a product of some unique combination of circumstances that we could only hope to be able to bottle. Um, I, I, I was an intern in 
on Capitol Hill when I was in college, and I, remember, and I was a gopher. I was running errands for Congressman Mike Andrews. And I remember distinctly that there wasn't an assignment they could give me back then that didn't, that didn't, that I couldn't find a way to have to walk by Charlie Wilson's office to deliver it, because Charlie Wilson was the only member of Congress with glass doors, because he had these three former Miss Universes in his front <laughs> office. And every, and I, so I'd always find an excuse to walk past Charlie Wilson's <laughs> office. Uh, he is a unique political personality. I don't know him well. I've met him a few times and, you know, obviously great yeah. character. I will say this. I know Arkansas has him as well. Uh, we have some great political characters, Ann Richards and Bob Bullock was a fascinating character. Uh, he was lieutenant governor when I was a staff member in the Senate and it's the closest thing I'll ever be able to, when I read biographies of Lyndon Johnson, I, the only way I can relate to that personality, because that personality is so alien to what most of us encounter or experience on a day to day, is I can relate to it because I met Bob Bullock and I worked a little bit with Bob Bullock. And so I know what those, it's, we have rich political characters. You know what's interesting after watching that movie too, it's surely for entertainment. Yeah. Well, he was an East Texas Democrat. I mean, the, the East Texas Democrats, you know, Charlie Stenholm, they, that redistricting, that re-redistricting was to take out guys like Charlie Wilson, who were old school Southern Dixiecrats who'd been representing their districts for a long time, who, whose voters voted Republican in the presidential race, but were never going to desert good old Charlie. And a lot of guys like him. Yes, sir. Back in, in relation to what you talked about, Ann Richards mm -hmm. and then looking at campaigns and women versus the reality of work, yeah. and say, more precision with jobs in Ohio and closer to Dayton, how do we get the process of politicians to actually educate what really goes on and give them a different look? That's a good question. And by the way, one of the, one of the if, if we had more a more nuanced discussion of, of your question about whether these primaries have been good or bad for the party would also have to engage in the discussion of did this protracted primary process force them to take hard, clear positions on issues where they would have preferred to remain fuzzy? And, and I think that there has been uh, some of the positions they've had to take have in the primary because we talked about how primaries pull you into the base of your own party, have given McCain an opening in the political center. Uh, how do we, how do we run to win? And if I understand your question, it's how do we run to win and not betray our principles? Is that And with the weak dollar, I, I had dinner last night with the former CFO of Dell who said the combination of the weak dollar and high gasoline prices, high fuel prices, make outsourcing uh, obsolete for most manufacturers that they're going to want to produce in America close to their market or they're going to produce wherever's closest to their market to minimize their, their exposure to transportation volatility. Uh, so your point is how do we go beyond soundbite politics? Yeah, because that... The, the, the primaries have had a problem with, I think, becoming a bit of a soundbite campaign in the last few months. Uh, you know, it's funny. Obama gave that speech about race in Philadelphia um, that, frankly, wasn't the issue, right? I mean, race, the, the Jeremiah Wright thing wasn't, wasn't clearly a race issue. Or if it was, it wasn't just a race issue. Uh, but he ended up saying a bunch of important things that, that most people considered to be well said and importantly said, uh, and not putting to bed the issue that had caused him to give the speech, right? And he then had to come back later and put the issue to bed. Uh, but meanwhile, he got a lot of credit for elevating the dialogue about something that wasn't really at, at issue. Uh, what I think that showed is that there's not much downside to nuance. I think his position on the gas tax demonstrated that again. 
politicians have been afraid of nuance for a long time uh, because blunt instruments seem to have prevailed in several recent elections. Uh, but I, I think that, I, and, and one thing that is unique about Obama is that people actually listen when he gives a long, nuanced speech. I mean, John Kerry, the, one of the things I observed when, uh, when, when the circus came to town in Texas was that the whole notion of surrogates has kind of gone out the door with Obama because you used to have to bring in surrogates to get people to come listen to the John Kerry speech, right? You had to get Bruce Springsteen to play to build a crowd so that they then have to listen to John Kerry speech. Obama builds a bigger crowd than, than Springsteen just by with an email one day, I'm going to be in your town tomorrow, show up. 35,000 people show up. Uh, people will listen. People are listening to nuance in this election cycle. I don't know if that will translate down the ballot. You know, when they run ads uh, in Mississippi and Louisiana that say, here's, here's Obama's pastor. He's crazy. Here's a candidate for Congress in Louisiana who hasn't renounced Obama, who hasn't renounced his preacher. I don't think that stuff's going to work. But if it does, then all of my optimism might fade. <laughs> because, uh, you know, because because that's, that's to your point. I, if, new, if, if, if you can elevate the dialogue and talk about the issues the way I think we've seen a little bit of this cycle, but not universally. It hasn't always been elevated and hasn't always taken higher ground. But when we have, it has seemed to work. So I hope that that's the direction we're going. Thank you guys very much for having me.